After the best complete season of David Peterson's young career, he is all but guaranteed a spot in the 2023 rotation. How good could he be next season? Could he actually be the Mets' number three starter come October? That's what I'm going to discuss on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Now, David Peterson is a former first-round pick, so we should not be shocked if this guy has a high ceiling at the big league level as a starting pitcher. What we saw this past season was a great, solid campaign from this guy. He was in and out of the rotation, you know, had to pitch out of the bullpen a little bit, and altogether, he was one of the best starters on the Mets, and really, he showcased a ceiling with his slider and the uptick in strikeouts that has me pretty optimistic about what David Peterson could be for the Mets in 2023 and beyond that. And, and, you know, if we look at everything he's done so far in his career, there's an interesting trend that I found when it comes to the expected metrics. So we'll start with his rookie season. David Peterson pitching in empty ballparks during the COVID-shortened year was a a star for that team. You know, it was him and Andres Jimenez that were – Kind of the, the lone bright spots on a roster that hit well but didn't win a lot of baseball games. And those were a few guys that just were able to really burst on the scene and have a lot of success. But the sample size was alarmingly small. Not even 50 full innings for Peterson. It was 49 and two-thirds. He did pitch to a 3.44 ERA. But you look at the expected metrics there. You know, his XFIP, which is expected fielding independent pitching, trying to tell you what the pitcher's value was should compute to as it relates to their ERA moving forward. It was 5.11. Now, he also struck out 7.25 batters per nine, walked 4.35 batters per nine, had a just FIP, a fielding independent pitching, of 4.52. 2021 rolls around. He pitches to a 5.54 ERA. So he was expected, based on XFIP, to pitch to a 5.11 ERA the following season all of your worst fears about Peterson showed up and he exploded in a bad way. Um, you know, he did see an uptick in strikeouts. That was good. 9.32 strikeout per nine. The walk rate, 3.92. Cut that down a bit. His FIP was 4.78, so that's not too far off from what he had in the 2020 season. But here's the interesting thing. Based on the strikeouts, based on the stuff, based on the fact that his left on base percentage around 65% was just dreadful and was due for some positive regression towards the mean, his XFIP was 3.93. What he pitched to this year? A 3.83 ERA. So now this is not a guarantee, but when I see a pitcher that year over year has gotten better, and you can say, well, he didn't get better in 2021 compared to 2020, the strikeout rate climbed by over two. Um, The walk rate was cut, and... You look at what happened there. For one, I don't know what the deal was about playing in empty ballpark, how that really would have affected home runs. But what I do know is he was playing in a lot of NL East ballparks. So if you think about pitching in Philadelphia, um, in Atlanta, it's another band box. Um, you know, they were facing the, the AL East that year. So you're pitching in you know, Fenway and, and uh, Yankee Stadium and Camden Yards before uh, the the fences were moved in or moved out. Um, you know, there could be a reason why his home run rate, um, you know, was a little bit crazy that year. And then it only continued in 2021 where 20% of the fly balls he gave up went out. I, I don't think 
that that was necessarily indicative of the pitcher he is, but also more some bad luck. Because the other thing that we can note from Peterson, we'll get to this in a little bit, is the launch angle has gone down against him. And I, I want to really dive into all these numbers, but here's what we saw this year with the 3.83 ERA. The strikeouts at 10.73 per nine, that is a big tick up from where he was in 2020. That's over three and a half strikeouts and more. And you look at that stat. He had the 14th highest strikeout rate in baseball this year when it comes to strikeout per nine among pitchers who hit 100 innings pitched. His strikeout per nine was better than Max Scherzer. It was by two decimal points, but it was still better than Max Scherzer. He went at least five innings without allowing more than three earned runs in 11 of his 19 starts, only had three starts where he gave up more than three earned runs altogether. Again, that's out of 19. So 16 of his starts, he allowed less than three earned runs or three earned runs or less. You go to the 2021 season, the year prior. In 15 starts, basically half of his starts were terrible. You know, he didn't make it um, through the fifth inning uh, eight times. So he made it through seven times in 15 tries. And, uh, you know, he gave up four earned runs or more in four of his 15 starts. Had another handful where he gave up three. Wasn't giving them that length. Just a completely different picture than what he ended up being this past year. Now, the, the issues are still whether he can pitch deep into games. Um, can he maintain that strikeout rate? Can he cut down the walks? But... Again, if you're looking at a pitcher that has an XFIP of 3.31 and all the other stats, unlike in 2020, where all the expected metrics were telling us, yeah, this guy's due for regression. Now it's like, oh, this guy's due for a little more ascension. And he's coming off the season where he eclipsed 100 innings pitch at the big league level. And he's pretty much guaranteed at this point a spot in the rotation You know, in an ideal world, he's your fifth starter going into the year because you added two great starting pitchers. But you can see a world where he's your fourth starter, and I'm comfortable with that. And I also think that in a rotation that's going to have Carlos Carrasco in it, um, you know, Peterson has every chance to be a better pitcher than him. And if that's the case, he's very close to getting a playoff start come next year. I I can see that for him. And really the big reason is the slider, and that's what we're going to talk about next here. You know, his slider is something that really did tick up the velocity altogether took up. You're talking about a pitcher that'll be 27 or just turned 27 in September. He's six foot six with a extension to the plate of over seven feet. So his velo and all those things, because of that extension, really jump on batters. And that's going to allow him moving forward, I think, to continue to be actually a really good strikeout pitcher, which is not what we were necessarily expecting. We saw our first little bit, a little taste of Peterson in that 2020 season. Before we get to any of that, though, today's episode is brought to you by Simply Safe. The numbers don't lie. In the last decade, over 4 million people have chosen Simply Safe Home Security to protect their home. You don't earn the trust of that many people without doing something right. At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. I know because I have Simply Safe Security in my home, and it's great to know that I have professional monitoring agents that have my back 24/7. Uh, with the 24/7 professional monitoring, Simply Safe's agents will call you the moment a threat is detected and dispatch police and first responders in the event of an emergency, even if you're not home or can't be reached. Simply Safe blankets your home protection with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door, HD security cameras for inside and outside your home, with smart ways to detect motion that only alerts you when a threat is real, and even hazard sensors that instantly detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB. Save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month for free. Visit simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB to learn more. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Every year in the big leagues so far, David Peterson has seen his velo tick up and his spin rates tick up on his slider. You look at the fastball velocity, sat at 92.1 in 2020, then went up to 92.7 in 2021. This year, all the way up to 93.7 miles per hour. So he's gained over a mile and a half of velo on his fastball since his rookie year. The slider velocity saw even more of an uptick, 81.3 in 2020, 82.1 in 2021, all the way up to 84.4. With that, you also see an uptick in spin rate. 
Uh, when it comes to the RPMs on his slider, it was 2186 to 2232. And this year climbed all the way up to 2325. Really good numbers. And what we've seen with that slider is now he's getting a tighter break on the pitch. It dropped 40 inches vertically in, in 2020 and 2021, or over 40 inches. Okay, so a, a big kind of sweeper. This year, the average vertical drop on his slider was 37.7 inches. Now, horizontally, it went from 6.8 to 5.3 to 3.9. So that break, when it comes to being a sweeping slider, has tightened up by multiple inches when it comes to the horizontal break and also many inches on the vertical break. So what you're seeing now is he's got a slider that spins more, that comes in harder, that's more difficult to the batter to differentiate from his fastball. So when he has that fastball that now also is up in velo, if he's throwing 94 on average with the pitch, up in the zone from a seven foot extension from the left side, that fastball is jumping on batters a lot harder than you would expect. You have that, okay? You pair that with a slider that's got this really tight break to it. This is the pitch mix that we're seeing around baseball. It's fastball slider. That's what everyone's trying to get to. Now, you know, some guys work in the cutter. There's guys that have splitters. There's guys that are sinker ball pitchers. It's not uniform. But when it comes to getting strikeouts, the number one combination we see in the game that gets swings and misses and gets strikeouts is a fastball that is up in the zone that guys aren't able to catch up to that gets you early strikes and a slider you can bury either at the bottom of the zone for a strike or out of the zone that guys swing through. That's what you want. And when it comes to swinging through, Peterson had a whiff percentage on his slider this year at 47.9%. The last two years, it's at around 37. So he added 10% to his whiff percentage. He's now getting whiffs on that slider nearly half the time. That's based on... You know, that change in movement. And also, because of the velocity uptick, because he's gone away from his sinker and has gone more to a, a fastball, that sinker was maybe falling into barrels a little bit too much for him when he was throwing it at the bottom of the zone. So he's keeping that fastball up. The launch angle against him, gone from 13 degrees to 10.3 degrees, all the way down to 8.1 degrees. He's cut his fly ball percentage when he was a rookie at 36.3%, all the way down to 26.9%. His ground ball percentage has gone from 44.4 to 49.4. So more ground balls, less fly balls. The soft contact has gone way up. 11.6 in 2020, 8.2 in 2021. Got hit really hard that year. And this year, 16.5. And the medium contact sat at around 57% in 2020 and 2021. That was down to 50% in 2022. So guys aren't hitting the ball as hard off him. They're not hitting it in the air as much. He's missing more bats. And this is going to be a great recipe for success moving forward. His swinging strikes were up this past year. So guys were swinging through more pitches. His zone percentage was down. So he was living in the zone less often, but guys were swinging more frequently. That's what you want. If your stuff can be that deceptive, you can mitigate your risk because if you can stay away from the heart of the plate, good chance batters are going to struggle to square you up, especially if you're still able to throw strikes out of the zone. The contact percentage was down. The outside the zone contact was way down. So the misses that he had outside the zone, guys were not you know, doing damage on him the way they had in the past where you know maybe his miss was you know a pitch that, was still belt high just outside or whatever it was that guys were still able to get to. When he missed, guys weren't touching him. But the outside of the zone swinging went up. So they were still swinging. They just weren't connecting the way they used to. You look at his pitch mix, and this is, I think, one of the most encouraging things to think about when it comes to how he can be better. 2020, 37.4% fastball um, through his slider 25.9% of the time, change up 187 Sinker 15.8, curve 2.2. 2021, for whatever reason, he decided to go to that sinker way more through a 28.7% of the time, just off the 29.9% he threw the four seam. Slider 24.4%, not too drastically different, but a slight tick down from how much he threw the pitch in 2020. And the changeup was at 16.3%, a little bit down as well. Curveball barely even threw it at 0.6. This year, 
We saw the pitch mix return to the success he had in 2020, that type of a breakdown, but with better stuff, i.e. getting the better results. And I know the ERA was better in 2020, but again, the strikeouts and all the other data will tell you that he was a way better pitcher this year than he was that year, and obviously over a larger sample size. This year, he threw the fastball 37.9% of the time, slider 29.1% of the time, changeup 16.3, sinker only 11.7, curveball up to 5%. If the Mets get him to throw that fastball over 40% of the time, I think you get that pitch maybe around 42%, and, and you abandon the sinker, in my opinion, would be the best thing to do. If he then brings that slider percentage up to about 35%, so now you're seeing maybe a mix where it's fastball slider closer to 80% of the time with a changeup and a curveball mixed in particularly um, against the um, right-handed batters at times. If you can do all of that, I think you could see more strikeouts, less contact, and an even better pitcher. And if he could go out next year and pitch to a low threes ERA over 30 starts and 170 innings, while striking out close to 11 batters per line because he did that this year. I mean, we could very well see a guy that could ascend to all-star potential. I don't think it's that far-fetched. I think that there's a chance if he has really good numbers in the first half. But more importantly, a guy that you're looking forward to taking the ball in a playoff game because he's that left-hander in your rotation that can really mix things up. You know, the Mets might sign an Andrew Heaney this year. Um... I like David Peterson a lot more than Andrew Heaney. Uh, and I think Andrew Heaney is a guy that strikes out a lot of batters and you can dream about his potential. I don't see any reason why the Mets can't alter the pitch match on David Peterson a little bit more and get a little more out of him. And he can be, I mean, a really, really nice weapon for them in the 2023 season. And he's going to get that opportunity because he's all but guaranteed a spot in the rotation. One thing that I was curious about, though, is, is it maybe time to extend a David Peterson we see a team like the Braves constantly extend their players, get them on team-friendly deals, and Peterson's actually a guy entering his final year of pre-arbitration that they should be talking to right now because they can lock him in to a number through arbitration a little bit beyond that gets some extra control and keep him cost-controlled for the foreseeable future. I want to discuss that in just a minute, but first, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to basketball to soccer and esports. They've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. BetOnline is always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. You can bet on free agents. Where are they going to land? Is Jacob DeGrom going to sign elsewhere from the Mets? If you think so, Bet on the team you expect him to go to, and maybe you can kind of uh, hedge your happiness a little bit, where if he signs with the Rangers, you'll be upset, but at least you'll get a little bit of a payday. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online, where the game starts. Should the New York Mets sign David Peterson to an extension right now? I firmly believe they should, and... Later this week, I will be doing an episode, I think on Friday's show, we're going to do it, um, where I'm going to go through the extensions the Mets should give out right now across the board. And really, there's two guys that you look towards, and that is Jeff McNeil and Pete Alonso. What would an extension look like for those two guys, and should the Mets jump on that and make it a priority this offseason? Spoiler alert for that show, I love extensions. Okay, You can lock guys into a lower number. If you believe in them as a player, sign them. John Neese is an interesting comparison to David Peterson because he was one of the last pre-arbitration deals the Mets signed. I mean, I didn't do a deep dive on the other deals that, that went down, but I don't know if there was one. Honestly, off the top of my head, I cannot think of a single pre-arb deal that has been signed since John Neese. And that contract should not scare the Mets away from doing pre-arb deals because it was a great deal for the Mets. They signed him ahead of the 2012 season. That was going to be his third full year in the rotation. The deal was for five years, just over $25 million. He went on to pitch to a 3.40 ERA over 30 starts and 190 in a third innings pitch. Really the best year of his career for John Neese. 
Had he not signed that contract, he would have gone into arbitration. He would not have gotten paid for that first year. But when he hit ARB, $5 million as a baseline, easy. I mean, easily would have made that and probably could have made a little bit north of that. And then he would have seen you know, those raises each year because the following seasons he continued to be a productive starting pitcher and starting pitching gets paid. So you look at the next two seasons, pitched with 3.71 ERA over 24 starts in year two, then a 3.40 ERA again in 30 starts in year three. So the Mets in those three seasons, those those were the three years that he would have got paid off of when it comes to arbitration. The result of that would have been at least $25 million. At least beyond that, the Mets get an extra extra year of control. So they had him in 2020 or 2015 where obviously the Mets go to the world series. He loses this spot in the rotation by the end of the year, but people forget that John East made 29 starts and had 33 appearances for the 2015 New York Mets pitched to a 4.13 ERA across 176 and two third innings pitch. Then he gets traded. They had that extra year of control due to the contract gets traded for Neil Walker heading into his final year, and then Walker hits 23 home runs for the 2016 Mets. So the Mets got an insane amount of value on that five-year deal. Across the four years that he pitched for the Mets, John Neese made 119 starts, pitched in 123 games, racked up just shy of 700 innings, and pitched to a 3.65 ERA. We, we forget how decent John Neese was. He was miscast as a number two on some horrible teams. But that's not his fault. He was a really good quality starting pitcher. And if I told you that you could get David Peterson, you know, to give you 700 innings over the next four years at a mid three ZRA, and you could sign him to an extension, you'd take it. Because, you know, if he was to go out next year, and let's just say he pitches to that XFIP, he goes out, he pitches to a 3 3 ERA this year, and he strikes out 200 because he pitches 108 in 80 innings. And his strikeout would indicate that if he got that much time and he could stay on the mound, he would strike out that many batters. How much money is he going to get in arbitration anyway? This is the time to lock him into a deal where he could say, I'm about to make whatever the minimum is, 700 some odd K or whatever it is from the the last um, CBA negotiations. Or he can make $5 million this season. And when you think about the allocation of your budget anyway, that's not going to hurt you one way or the other on luxury tax, saving that three or four million, whatever his first year salary is. It could be as low as three million dollars, even. I went to look at some other pre arbitration extensions to try to find a ballpark. You know, is the five year, $25 million from Johnny's from a decade ago unrealistic nowadays? Well, Aaron Ashby with the Brewers this past year signed a five year, $20.5 million deal with two club options, a $9 million option with a buyout. And then a $13 million option, the buy was for a mil. So that puts, I think, the minimum guarantee of the contract at the 21.5. But he has escalators in the deal. And if both options are picked up, that's an additional $25.5 million. So the max value of the contract could be a seven-year $46 million deal. It's an absolute steal if Aaron Ashby, who's not even as proven as David Peterson, can be a quality left-handed starter for some time. Now, he was at just a half a year of service time, a little bit over that, when he signed that contract with the Brewers. Peterson's over two years of service time, so he's closer to his arbitration years, which means you're going to have to pay him a little bit more. So then I looked and tried to find a similar contract extension signed based on service time, and the name I fell on was Marco Gonzalez. just happens to be another left-handed pitcher. Signed a four-year, $30 million extension with the Mariners. Similar service time um, heading into the 2020 season a lefty that now has a 4.08 career ERA. That contract gave him a million dollar signing bonus, $5 million year one, 5.5 million year two, 6.5 million year three, $12 million in his final year, which would have been his last year of arbitration. Um, And then you get a a $15 million club option. The Mariners did that didn't have a buyout attached to it. So that's just, Hey, if he's still good and you want him for 15 mil, you have the option to pick that up. So what they basically did is instead of a five-year deal, it was a four-year deal, and then they were able to get that club option tacked on at no risk to them whatsoever. That's a great contract. I would sign David Peterson to that contract tomorrow, and I think that he might even sign it or at least something similar. Um, you know, The deal that I ended up going with was basically taking the John Neese contract, inflating it, 
$10 million. And also realizing that I think David Peterson has a higher ceiling than John Neese did. And um, to a certain extent, even Marco Gonzalez, as, as far as the strikeouts are telling us, he's got really good stuff here. So, you know, if you're looking at the AAV of that contract at $7 million for five years, you can buy it as arbitration and get an extra year on that deal. Maybe even work in a club option. So you can buy out, um, you know, all of his arbitration and get two years of his free agency beyond that. You know, you're locking him into ages 27, 28, 29, and 30, which you already had. You can lock him through age 32 at a reasonable number. If it is, let's say, five years, 35 million club option for 15 million on a sixth year, and you even throw a $5 million buyout to it if you want to, it's still. Even in that scenario, you know, six years, fifty million. The the Rockies have been signing their guys to extensions at, you know, five years, fifty million, five years, sixty four million, for Senzatella and Kyle Freeland. So, I mean, Peterson, as someone that I think going forward, the baseline of what I expect from David Peterson, you're going to get an ERA between three five and four two. I think somewhere in that range, depending on the season and a guy that I really believe can stay healthy. He's a big guy, big frame that you can count on to be in your rotation for a long time at a cost control number. And when you consider the lack of other pitching that this organization has, that makes it even more important to me that the Mets lock this guy up and just give themselves one constant because the rest of this rotation, when it comes to the price tag, it's going to get a little bit out of hand. It would be nice to have one leg of it that you didn't have to worry about. Anyway, though, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. We'll give you two more shows this week. Tomorrow, a Thanksgiving special. What are we thankful for as Mets fans? Always fun to do that. And I have a really special um, thing that I'm personally thankful for as it relates to this show that I'm going to share um, for Thanksgiving. Then on the final show of the week, we'll get right back into this conversation when it comes to extensions for Jeff McNeil and Pete Alonzo. But that's going to be all. Again, as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review where we get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked on Mets. Thank you for making Locked on Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out Locked on Sports Today, hosted by Peter Bukowski. Locked on Sports Today is where you want to go to stay up to date with everything going on in the sports world. With instant game reactions, breaking news, and take of the day, you can follow Locked On Sports today on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts.